Good afternoon. Uh, time may be relative, but in Kent, Connecticut, we try to start on time. And we're here with Kip Thorne. Kip was one of the co-founders of LIGO, a, uh, the Feynman professor at Caltech Emeritus. I can think of no five better words to string together <laughs> than that. And um, somebody who helped uh, launch what ended up approximately on the 100th anniversary of Einstein's publication of the theory of general relativity to be the discovery of the gravity waves that are a consequence and almost a proof of that theory. So I thought we'd let Kip start with a four or five minute um, slideshow, an introduction, and then we'll pepper him with questions about the origins of the universe. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Walter. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Yeah. Uh, Walter and I did this with several of my colleagues once before in New York. Right after Science they Festival. won the Copley right Prize, so yeah. congratulations. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm going to begin with a movie, not the one I advertised on my chest uh, yesterday, <laughs> but another one. Both of these movies are based on computer simulations, but this is the story now in a little more detail of what it is we saw. 1.3 billion years ago, when on Earth, multicelled life was just forming and beginning to spread over the world. Two black holes circled round and round, and this is what they would have looked like if you had been there looking with your own eyes. Uh, what you see is they're in front of a star field, lots and lots of stars back there, and they're distorting the images of the stars to produce this remarkable optical display. Uh, one black hole is a little bigger than the other, they're spiraling together as they lose energy to gravitational waves. They just collided. Whoa. And that did not look very impressive, but it looks much more impressive, as I will show the later movie later on, uh, if you look in on our universe from a higher dimension. But in fact, in that collision, the black holes released in gravitational waves three solar masses of energy, what you would get by annihilating three suns and turning it all into gravitational wave energy. And those waves traveled out through the universe, leaving the galaxy in which they were born, across the great reaches of intergalactic space, a billion light years, so they traveled for a billion years, or 1.3 billion years, until 50,000 years ago, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, these gravitational waves reached the edge of our own Milky Way galaxy. And on September 14 of last year, they arrived at the Earth, down near the South Pole. They traveled up through the Earth, arriving at one of our LIGO detectors. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory in Louisiana, Livingston, Louisiana, where they've had these terrible floods in the last uh, week. Uh, and then seven milliseconds later, arrived at our other detector in Hanford, Washington, what you see in these detectors are long vacuum pipes, four kilometers, two and a half miles long. Uh, and I'm going to now show you a theorist version of what's inside. Now, what's inside is really complicated, but I'm a theorist, so I make it look really simple. <laughs> I'm going to stand up and just point to it. So you have four mirrors that are hanging from overhead supports. Each of these mirrors is about this size. It weighs 40 kilograms, about 100 pounds. Uh, and uh, when the gravitational wave comes along, it stretches and squeezes space, and so these mirrors are pushed apart while those are pushed together because they're riding on space. Uh, they're pushed apart, those are pushed together, and then with the next half cycle of oscillation of the waves, these are pushed together, and those, or these are pushed together, those are pushed apart, and we use the laser beams to monitor that motion. And that motion is really, really tiny. The distance between the mirrors is four kilometers, as I said. The motion is 10 to the minus 15 centimeters, or one one hundredth the diameter of the proton. And the noise level in these instruments is 100 times below that, almost 100 times below that. So these are incredibly accurate instruments. Just how small was the mirror's motion? Even for physicists, I like to go through this. Begin with one centimeter. Divide it by 100, you get the thickness of a human hair. Divide by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that we're using to make these measurements. Divide by 10,000, you get the Whoa. diameter of an atom. 
Divide by 100,000, you get the diameter of the nucleus of an atom or of a proton. Divide by 100 again, and that's what LIGO saw. Hmm. This is amazing technology, and Walder and I can talk about that a little later. This is what the signal looked like when it came in. This is the raw signal uh, with just uh, one thing having been done. The instrument is rather noisy at high frequencies, so everything above 350 hertz was removed, 350 cycles per second. It's noisy at low frequencies. Everything below 35 hertz was removed. Uh, and this is the raw data uh, with just that removal of the lowest and highest mm. frequency waves uh, from the two sites in Hanford, Washington, Livingston, Louisiana. And the signal stands out really strong and agrees beautifully between the two sites. When you clean the signal up, you get the gray line kind of fuzzy because uh, that's the noise after cleaning the signal up with, by various techniques. And the wh little white, a little red thing is from a computer simulation. And the computer simulation is the thing that is used. You compare with the computer simulation in order to figure out what was the source. And it's uh, that beautiful comparison between the two that tells us that this was two black holes spiraling around each other, merging, colliding. Uh, and that tells us that the masses of the black holes were 29 times the mass of the sun and uh, 36 uh, times the mass of the sun, and three solar masses of energy were lost in gravitational waves. That all comes from comparing the computer simulations. So this was really a remarkable discovery, and it opens up a whole new way of observing the universe. You talk about uh, gravi gravitational waves. What is being waved? Is it the fabric of the cosmos? Is it space-time? It is. It's, I like to think of it as being very similar to ripples on a very calm lake uh, that are uh, created when you throw a rock, drop a ro rock into the lake. But instead of the surface of the water being rippled, it's the shape of space. And it shows up then, and the aspect of it that LIGO builds on is it's not space going up and down. It's actually being stretched and squeezed. Mm -hmm. And that stretching and squeezing of space is uh, then what pushes the mirrors back and forth. I said it came at the 100th anniversary of the publication of General Relativity. Is it inevitable that there would be gravity waves if general relativity is true? It is absolutely inevitable. Uh, if relativity is true, even before he had general relativity, of course, as, as Walter knows, having being the uh, author of the definitive biography of Albert well, thank Einstein. Thank you, but it's not quite. But yeah. <laughs> but it's, thank you anyway. anyway. Uh, when he had his special theory of relativity, it told us that nothing can propagate faster than the speed of light. But Newton's laws of gravity said that uh, gravity is instantaneous. So in other words, and Newton so felt if the moon disappeared, instantly, instantly the tides would disappear. And relativity, even before general relativity, it said that's not possible. So Newton was wrong. And uh, so it, whatever was going to be the correct theory had to have a finite speed of propagation of the pr gravitational force, because nothing could go faster than the speed of light. But if you say nothing goes faster than the speed of light, when those two black holes are colliding, at a certain point it looks like they do violate the speed limit. Is Einstein wrong on that? So Einstein is not wrong. Um, Good. The, <laughs> <feel much better. laughs> the speed limit's a little more tricky than we usually say it is, in the sense that this is an absolute speed limit for things that are close together. Uh, if there's no warping of space in between them, it's an absolute speed limit. So if you warped space when those collided. Uh, when those collided, and even before they collided, they were warping space greatly. And uh, that uh, warping then means that it's a little hard even to say how fast something on this side of, uh, of the two black holes is moving relative to something on that side, because space is warped in between. And so the whole issue of uh, the speed limit becomes fuzzy if you have the warping present. But it's still there. But it's still is, there. It's and still is, there. is that the reason you have to have gravity waves? No, I think you have to have gravity waves because of this business that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Uh, and once the waves get, uh, get away from the black holes, they get very weak. And so they may fo uh, constitute some warping but such weak warping that uh, the speed limit becomes very rigid. Oh, yeah, I mean, in our normal yeah, day, yeah, the speed yeah, of light yeah, doesn't. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How come Einstein had some doubts about this? Einstein 
had momentary doubts. Oh, I don't think we have any evidence that he had long-term doubts. About the existence, about of, the gravity existence wave. of gravitational waves. So the mathematics is a little tricky, and the <laughs> physical interpretation of the mathematics is tricky. And it took a while and work be, by people beyond Einstein to get it totally sorted out. But he had a, a momentary pause in the 1930s when, in uh, correspondence with friends, he referred to uh, some doubts about uh, existence of gravitational waves, about his own predictions. But we have no evidence that those doubts lasted longer than a few days. And he was a little skeptical about black holes at first, right? He was similarly skeptical about black holes. They were so bizarre. I think all, almost all physicists were very skeptical about them in the uh, 1920s, 30s, 40s, into the 50s. Uh, and it, again, it required digging much more deeply into the theory in order to come to grips with the physical interpretation of, uh, uh, of the mathematics in order to sort this all out. So the only times Einstein were wrong was when he began to doubt his own theories, whether it be gravity, w gravitational <laughs> waves, expansion of the universe, the existence of black those, holes. I think those are his big mistakes. Yeah. He should have just theory. trusted That's his right. own That's theory. Right. You know, when you first began studying relativity, and I think it was with John Wheeler, yes. that was a abandoned backwater of a field. I mean, I assume particle physics, quantum theory, everything else was a lot cooler. How did you get into deciding to be, did you know this would be so cool, relativity? I, I hoped it would be. Oh, good. <laughs> it was beginning to look interesting. Uh, the discovery of quasars in 1963 led to our really believing black holes exist out there, but that took a few years beyond that. I began working with John Wheeler in 1962. So. Just, just before uh, things started to open up observationally. From my own point of view, I, at that time and up uh, still today, very much dislike working in a crowded field. And I wanted to find some field of science that had a possibility of really becoming exciting, where I could do something interesting and fun and uh, maybe have some impact. And it, had to not be in what was popular. And so, so what was popular then, quantum or particle? Nuclear physics and oh, yeah. particle physics uh, were really the popular things in that era, and so I avoided that. And so tell me how you ended up co-founding LIGO in the history of that. Let me just uh, oh. uh, bring up a, a couple of slides to discuss that. Uh, they. Pro they told me they were going to take this off the screen while I fiddled, but uh, that's all right. Keep fiddling a little. Get, there we go. Uh, nope. Here we go. Okay. So I just want to show you some people, because people are the things. You started with the right so, one. Yeah. We begin with Albert Einstein, who not only uh, formulated general relativity in, 19, in the late 1915, but predicted gravitational waves in June of 1916. And, uh, he, and when he, when he uh, predicted gravitational waves in his uh, two papers, seminal papers on this in 1916, 1918, he basically said, uh, these waves are so weak uh, that it's not likely that people will ever see them uh, observationally. He was wrong, but he was wrong because he could not predict the march of technology and he could not predict phenomena like black holes. These were unknown at the time. Uh, Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland was the first person to uh, have the uh, chutzpah to uh, think he might be able to detect gravitational waves. He developed gravitational wave detectors, so evidence that he uh, thought was evidence of gravitational waves turned out not to be, but he pioneered the field. He pointed it in a very fruitful direction, and the rest of us built on that. Uh, this is me in 1966. I've moved, moved the hair off my head onto my chin. That's a hair. And, and uh, so I went to Caltech in 66. I built a theory group uh, following on my training with Johnny Wheeler, working on the theory of gravitational waves and sources of gravitational waves and black holes and neutron stars. In parallel, Ray Wise, whom I had known at Princeton, he was a postdoc when I was a graduate student, he began thinking about ways to detect gravitational waves, and in 1972, he invented the kind of detector that uh, we finally used to make the detection. 
Uh, and he, an interesting guy, Ray Weiss, he believed he should not publish anything about this in the regular literature until gravitational waves were discovered. And so he wrote a seminal paper, one of the most powerful papers I've ever read, laying out the design of these detectors, uh, identifying all the major sources of noise that these detectors would have to face, and uh, working out how to deal with the noise and what kind of sensitivity they could achieve, and basically said, laid out a blueprint for the first generation of our detectors, all in 1972, a brilliant, a brilliant man. Um, and uh, Ray and a colleague in Russia, Vladimir Braginsky, convinced me that this was going to succeed and so I got Caltech into the game, and we brought Ronald Drever from Glasgow, Scotland, who invented some wonderful improvements on Ray Weiss's ideas, Stan Whitcomb, and built a 40-meter prototype in 80 to 83. In 1984, Ray Weiss, Ron Drever, and I, uh, Caltech, created LIGO as a collaboration between Caltech and MIT and the National Science Foundation. Uh, and then we brought on Robbie Vogt at Caltech to direct us in 1987 because we tried to run this, Walter, as a Troika leadership uh, trying to run this project by consensus. And you can't run a big project by right. consensus. An R&D program, maybe. And so we got burned by our in ineptness at running it. And so we brought on Robbie, who knocked heads together and uh, uh, led us in writing a construction proposal in 89. Mm -hmm. We said we would build facilities uh, to house these, and then we would build a two generations of detectors, initial interferometers, we call these things interferometers, at a sensitivity where if we were really lucky, we would see something, we probably wouldn't see anything. Uh, but we would get our feet wet and uh, really understand the problems with these. And then we would build advanced interferometers. And the first ones didn't work. And the first ones, so they, they didn't see anything. So how in heaven's but, name? But did, we oh. told NSF. Uh, so right. in, in National fact, Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation. We struggled to get funded. In nine, and, we, and part of the struggle was we said from the outset, our odds of success with the first instruments are low. They are practice instruments. If we're lucky, we'll see something but you have to be ready to fund us through two generations of instruments before we'll have success. Well, let, let me ask a question on that, which is something we're so sorely lacking now in our society uh, and civic life, which is this ability to say to government or to whoever it may be, national science, why don't we spend a lot of money just to learn something, even though we don't know that there'll be a practical application? How did that happen, and are you worried that we don't do that anymore? Well, I worry that the uh, National Science Foundation is much more risk averse than it was then. This was a high risk because of the technology required, but very high payoff. And the payoff was not so much a technological payoff for everyday life, though there are spinoffs. The payoff was that we would open up a whole new world, way of viewing the universe. That we would be able to see things that humans have never been able to see before. You mean it's like a telescope? And so it's like a telescope. In fact, there are two forms of radiation uh, that you can study the universe with uh, that propagate with the speed of light and bring us detailed information. Gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. Uh, Galileo opened the, uh, our view of the universe with electromagnetic waves when he pointed his optical telescope at the sky centuries ago. And what has followed has been all a, 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 a fallout or a, a follow through on what Galileo did. So we discovered and, the entire universe through Galileo's telescope. What are you going to discover well, through, through this? Through Galileo's that was the beginning, right. but then, of course, there was a lot well, of development. Yeah, but, yeah. But, yeah. But, I'm but sorry, through sense, light waves and right, electromagnetic that's waves, that's right, we've discovered right. the universe. So that, so that, what did we discover through gravity that, waves? That gave us x-rays later, uh, radio waves. These are all electromagnetic. Gravitational waves are a whole new way. They're the other form of radiation that we can do this with. Uh, there are also our neutrinos, which are particles that, uh, that bring us some amount of information. But, uh, but these are the two biggies. Um, and so, just as electromagnetic waves have been the mainstay of astronomy over several centuries, gravitational waves will be, along with electromagnetic waves, over the coming decades and several centuries into the future. So, 
the, the story, the, the way that the reason that NSF bought in and the Congress bought in, and they stood by us staunchly, both NSF and Congress through Republican and Democratic administrations from 1992 onward when they finally funded us, uh, was this vision of opening up a whole new way to observe the universe and the uh, remarkable things that we may see. And so we were funded in 92. Barry Barish was the really, uh, should be regarded as the fourth leader of this. He, he led us in the transition from a small R&D team through the construction of facilities, the uh, construction of the first interferometers, uh, the expansion of LIGO to include 1,000 scientists in uh, 15 nations, uh, and then the, uh, the design of the advanced interferometers before he left us to lead another high energy physics project. Uh, but that's how we got to be here, uh, and it w has been for Ray Weiss and me, it has been a uh, half century uh, effort cool. for uh, NSF. It's been about 40 years since they began funding us for Congress. It's been uh, closer to 30 A years. half century effort to detect gravitational waves. What was it like when the phone rang that morning? <laughs> well, what I got was an email. Okay. <laughs> so I'm old fashioned. I, was, I thought they would have called. <laughs> no. And, and so the signals came in. A computer uh, analyzing the data saw the signals, uh, created a web page that says, here is a candidate for a gravitational wave. Here is what was seen in Hanford, Washington. Here is what was seen in uh, Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, and anybody, any of the 1,000 people in this collaboration could go look at that web page. And, uh, and, and the computer sent out messages to key people in, in leadership positions. And one of those uh, is, a, is a successor of mine at Caltech named Christian Ott. He emailed me and said, go look at this web page. We have a candidate. I looked at it. It was too good to be true. I was not expecting anything this good. It was the source I expected. The, fir the first thing I expected to see, and this is what I had been, been uh, arguing since the early 1980s, was two massive black holes colliding. But the signal was so strong and so clean that uh, there was an issue, could that have been put in by hand? And we do do this to test the system from time to time. Uh, there's a committee of three people who are charged to put in signals by hand. They go in and they wiggle the mirrors back and forth. They apply electrical forces to the mirrors and wiggle them. And they do it in just precisely the manner that corresponds to a particular source, two black holes colliding at that location. At, uh, and, uh, and particular masses for the black holes and the sp speeds of their spins. Uh, and uh, then we see whether or not uh, the signal can be detected and whether the, uh, can, the team can agree on it and sort the whole thing through. Uh, and we've gone through this exercise a couple of times before. So I said, to, I uh, emailed back to Christian and said, this, surely this must be a injection. He said, no, I'm one of the three people in charge of injections. We did not do it. Wow. And uh, then, of course, we went through a period of about five months of being absolutely sure that this was the real thing. If it had been an injection, there are fingerprints left, left in a, a number of different data channels uh, that are just unavoidable. And uh, there were no fingerprints. You know the story of when Einstein got the telegram saying that the eclipse experiment had confirmed general relativity and the amount light would bend, and the graduate student said, what would you have done had the telegram said the opposite? Do you know what his answer was? I would have felt sorry for the good Lord because the theory is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did you have that feeling? Actually, I had the feeling, let me put it, I had a feeling of profound satisfaction. Good because this is what I had been expecting, this is what I've been working for, or toward for uh, my entire career. And it had come out just the way I had hoped, but even cleaner than I, I didn't have any right to hope the signal would be as strong and clean as this one was. Um, Ray Weiss, his reaction was, I got a monkey off my back. Oh, good. Uh, he uh, was carrying around a load of guilt that uh, he and I and our team had uh, 
had convinced uh, NSF and Congress to spend $1.1 billion of taxpayer money on this, and we didn't have any gravitational waves yet. And wow. so, uh, you, did, you just mentioned the way you inject something. Yeah. It was a wiggling of the mirror, something we can all understand. But I assume that's the tiniest of all wiggles a mirror could possibly be wiggled, right? It is uh, unbelievably. It's, it's this, I showed you how small it is. It's unbelievable. It's small. smaller than a photon. Yeah. Yeah. So you're really down at a quantum level. You have to account for quantum uncertainty we when are, you do it? We are indeed. Uh, so the uh, always before, so, so in quantum physics, the key thing that happens is fluctuations, and they're unavoidable. Uh, and a uh, electron inside an atom, you can't say what precisely where it is, has a probability for being at this location, that location, and another location. We deal with probabilities. Uh, you make a measurement of where a particle is, and that disturbs the particle, and so its uh, uh, actual location is, uh, is uncertain, and it's continually fluctuating all the time. In LIGO, the center of mass of these mirrors, that's a technical phrase, but that's basically what we measure. It's the average position of all the matter in the mirror. The center of mass of these mirrors fluctuates due to quantum physics at just the level that of the advanced LIGO noise. Hmm. And so for the first time in human experience, we are in, the, in our detectors, in this generation of detectors, we are beginning to see the quantum fluctuations of human-sized objects because these measurements are so exquisitely accurate. And that has required a building into the design of these instruments an ability to deal with quantum behavior of a 40 kilogram particle, colored particle mirror. It's, it's really quite, quite remarkable. Amazing. One of the problems still facing physics is sort of the incompatibility of general relativity with quantum theory. I may be right or wrong on that, so correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. But if they are incompatible, it's the fact is we're never at a place where they really do have to intersect. You are actually then at that place where they intersect. We're at a place where they intersect, but a place where we understand what we're, where we think we understand what we're doing. <laughs> okay. um, the place where they intersect most deeply uh, is at the beginning of the universe, in the Big Bang, in the singularities at the centers of black holes, and in the, the, where they really come face to face, fully face to face, uh, that's where the deepest issues of uh, fundamental physics arise, the laws of quantum gravity, string theory. Uh, and uh, LIGO is a little different. We are in a place where they intersect, but they intersect uh, sufficiently weakly it's that uh, it, there is no incompatibility at this level. And uh, mm -hmm. that means we can use quantum technology, we are using quantum technology uh, to uh, measure gravitational waves, which are a general relativity phenomenon, and so the intersection is where but we are. But you just said kind of the quantum gravity, yeah. which implies that gravity is not just a wave, but it's a particle. Is that true? That uh, fundamental physics says that is true, and that the gravitational waves that we have seen are carried by particles called gravitons. Which this, are what size compared to a proton? Uh, which are, uh, uh, which, whose positions are highly uncertain. Okay. <laughs> but we can think of them as being truly point particles, but their positions are highly uncertain. Uh, these, it's similar to a photon, uh, which carries electromagnetic waves. When you have lots and lots of photons all doing the same thing, uh, working together uh, like a marching uh, 19th century army, uh, they behave like a wave. And that's the way things are with radio waves. We don't see individual photons in radio waves. Or light waves. Or that, yeah, which yeah, is well, in light radio. waves, we can see individual photons, if, uh, but in radio waves, we don't have the technology mm -hmm. yet. Um, 
Gravitational waves are the most extreme of this. They are highly classical in the sense that the number of uh, gravitons involved in the gravitational waves that our team detected is something like 10 to the 40. Uh, that's uh, one with uh, 39 zeros. So you will never detect in our lifetime a graviton? N not in our lifetime, no because uh, there are just so many of them doing the same thing at the same time that it behaves like a wave and there's, it's hopeless to see the individual gravitons. A moment ago you said something interesting which is another place where these things intersect is in the first second of the universe existence. Does the LIGO experiment, will it in the future help us understand that first second of the universe? Uh, or how the universe began? Yes. I say. So, Gravitational waves will. Now, this brings me to the issue that, uh, like uh, in, in, with electromagnetic waves, today we have optical astronomy, we have x ray astronomy, we have radio astronomy, infrared astronomy, all using electromagnetic waves with different wavelengths, very short wavelengths for x rays. But wait, real quickly, does gravitational waves have different wavelengths? And so, gravitational waves oh, also have different wavelengths. And in the next 20 years, maybe next, uh, within the next 20 years, we will have three more wavelength bands opened up using other kinds of detectors. So LIGO is the beginning. LIGO is the analog of, uh, of Galileo pointing his optical telescope at the sky. Uh, we will have a technique based on something like LIGO in space with separations, uh, monitoring the separation between spacecraft that are millions of kilometers apart, tracking each other with laser beams, looking for gravitational waves that have 10,000 times longer mm. wavelength than LIGO does. So uh, LIGO is like the optical astronomy. This LISA instrument is like radio astronomy. So LISA's up in space? Will be up in space. Oh, OK. Will be up I, in I space. I see a slide that says the future. So maybe yeah. I should say, what's yeah. the future? Yeah, so well, that's part of the future. <laughs> okay. And uh, let's. Uh, let, let me just uh, pick a different piece of future, though. Um, we like having multiple futures. Here, let's talk about windows onto the universe here. Um, Whoops, we've lost. OK, can you bring us back onto the screen? Yeah, oh, here we okay, go, here windows we go. onto the OK, universe. so I was talking about electromagnetic windows, uh, optical, radio, x-ray. So similarly, gravitational windows, we have LIGO. These are uh, gravitational waves that oscillate with millisecond uh, periods. LISA, flying in space, spacecraft tracking each other with laser beams, oscillating with periods of minutes to hours. A technique using radio telescopes that look at pulses of radio waves from distant sources called pulsars. Uh, when a gravitational wave goes over the Earth, it speeds up our clocks and slows our clocks down, we never notice it because it's just our environment. Uh, but relative to the rest of the universe, our clocks speed up and slow down by minuscule amounts. But these pulsars are clocks of their own and they are sending signals in that are precisely timed. And so it will appear to us that the pulsar signals are speeding up and slowing down the same whether the pulsars in that direction, this direction, or this direction. But actually, the pulsars are correct. They are correct. And our and clocks are, are being wrong. affected That's as right. That's general right. relativity That's once right. again tells us they should be. That's right. And so this is another technique which is on the verge of seeing gravitational waves. But this sees uh, gravitational waves with periods of years. Mm -hmm. And then there's a technique called, that I don't want to go into, but it's called the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. We will see gravitational waves from the birth of the universe, uh, the, from the period of inflation right after the universe was born. These are the four frequency bands, four different kinds of gravitational wave astronomy we will have within the next 20 years. LIGO is just the beginning, and that's where I return to the first one second of the life of the universe. Throughout this suite of types of instruments, I expect that by uh, the 2040s, uh, if not sooner, that uh, the most important thing that uh, we will be doing with gravitational waves is exploring the first one second of the life of the universe. And what happened then? Well, so there was the Big Bang. Gravitational waves of some sort came off the Big Bang. 
They then will, are predicted, predicted to have been amplified by what is called inflation. The earliest moments of the universe, the universe expanded unbelievably fast, and then the expansion slowed down. And that is predicted to have amplified whatever came off the Big Bang. We will be looking for that stuff that came off the Big Bang, amplified, and trying to decipher the details of what came off the Big Bang and how it was modified by this inflation. The other thing that is really interesting is the fundamental uh, forces of nature were not always uh, what we see today. The electromagnetic force didn't exist in the earliest moments of the universe. It came into being uh, when the universe was about a billionth of a second old uh, and came into being uh, through what is called a phase transition. It's like, uh, like water vapor turning into water droplets in a cloud. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we began with something called the electroweak force, and as the universe expanded and cooled, it split apart and we got the electromagnetic force, the electrical force and the magnetic force, they began to exist as individual entities. And that birth of those forces uh, it occurred initially in droplets, like water droplets, but these droplets then expanded and collided, if the theory says, at the speed of light and produced gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves are in the frequency band, the wavelength band for Lisa to see. So we hope that with Lisa we will watch the birth of the electromagnetic force when the universe was a fraction of a second old. So these are the kinds of things that I think we have in our, in our future with this future. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions, because I'm sure that some of you still have questions about how the universe began. Uh, but as the lights come up, let me just ask a more policy yeah. question yeah. to get us back down to the planet Earth, which is, suppose you were trying to sell the funding of this next phase. Do you find it easier to go to Washington and sell it on the, th on the argument that this will tell us more about how our universe began? Or is it easier to sell it on a more utility argument that it'll make GPS work better and we'll have better airplanes? So uh, I have to say we did sell it on the argument this will help us understand the universe. Uh, we did not uh, sell it on the basis of the technology. We, uh, we talked about technological spin-offs, but that was a small piece of it. The way I like to think about it is this, that when we look back on the era of the Renaissance and we ask what did we, our generation, get from that era, it was great art, great architecture, uh, the scientific method, uh, great music. Uh, these are cultural things. And when our descendants, a few centuries from now, look back on this era, and, and they ask, what did we get from the era of the 20th, 21st centuries? I think a big piece of that will be an understanding of our universe and of the laws that govern it. And uh, so that's what it's all about for me. Amen. Questions, please, thoughts? Anybody disagree with anything he said? You're well, to argue. Well, well, people are trying to think whether, whether yeah. or not they understood a word I said. Let me say one other thing. Sure, yes, sir. I think it's very important to me personally. I, I left the LIGO project uh, in the early uh, 2000s uh, to start an effort in uh, simulating gravitational wave sources in collaboration with the uh, uh, Salt Ecolcy's group at Cornell because we didn't have the technology then to do these simulations. That were crucial computer to simulations. Computer right. simulations. And that was a second, uh, uh, a second uh, prong of this, coming together with the experiment to make this be a success. But as a result, I was not there in the end game on this. Uh, I have had the, and, which I'm happy about because there's no elbow room left. And, and so the next generation is the one that pulled it off. They are the ones that deserve the credit because it's an incredibly difficult technology. But it's a younger generation that have had this enormous success and uh, I have to really give uh, credit to them for pulling off and making the dreams that Ray and I had uh, a reality. Bravo, bravo, thank you. Uh, Walt, Walter alluded to this a little bit, but I'm curious, you got Congress to approve appropriations of a billion dollars over a long period of time. How did you, and, and then you suddenly 
has felt you had something to show for it. How did you, how did you accomplish that? Well, I didn't do it, uh, but our team. You had a mole in the midst, <laughs> too, right? So as well, it, it, the, there was a, a man named Richard Isaacson, who was the no program relation, director. No I hate to say. That's right, <laughs> a program director at NSF. Uh, Richard had begun as a theorist. And in fact, he had done one, one of the most important pieces of theoretical research that underpins this that, that, of anybody. He had showed us how to quantify the energy and the momentum that are carried by gravitational waves in an era when this was a puzzle that uh, was uh, uh, in physics that had, people had struggled with for decades. So he had a real coup at his, at his, uh, that he had achieved. And then he went to NSF as a program director. And he w worked hand in hand with us to make this happen from the Washington side. Of course, he was down inside NSF, but he was able to uh, convince uh, uh, his uh, division chair, the physics division, Marcel Bardon, to back it, and together they convinced the, uh, the uh, leaders of NSF and then the National Science Board, uh, and ultimately Congress. Robbie Volk played a big role, and then Barry Barish is, is directors of LIGO in working with Congress to get this through. But uh, the vision was so compelling uh, and there was a willingness to take a risk. It is a high risk uh, with very high potential payoff. Uh, and it uh, was working the halls of Congress, uh, but by uh, the director of the project, not by me. By that was when we did big science, such as send a man to the moon, build the internet, uh, maybe even some of these great telescopes that we started to do. Are you worried that government just doesn't have the appetite for that anymore? I think I worry, but I don't think I have much wisdom about it. Okay. I, again, I didn't work in halls of Congress myself. And this, in fact, this is not, this is the biggest project NSF had done, but NSF does largely small science. The really big things are done at DOE and at NASA. But the Magellan telescopes yeah, are having some that's problems right. There are now. problems there, but I, but I should say this was big enough that it was a big deal in congressional committee, but not a big deal on the, on the floor of Congress. So that's the secret, okay. Yeah. Keep I, it in I, committee. I yeah. wanted to ask uh, something which simply, we're so many laymen here. Where are this you? I'm <laughs> right, right in the here. middle. Okay, thank right you. Right here. I wanted to ask, since we're so many laymen in this audience, uh, and we know that many, many, many wonderful things that we find every day of our life have emanated from your research. And could you elaborate a little so that we could be more grateful to you <laughs> and so that we could uh, talk about it among ourselves and maybe interest somebody in it? I mean, one whole painting of dots might pay a lot of <laughs> money towards your effort, for example. Yeah, so, so uh, <laughs> on a, a te technological sense or sort of a more everyday sense, one of the key things that is needed is lasers that are very stable, put out a very pure frequency because that, that is required for a number of technological applications that, that we deal with in, uh, in everyday life. The technique to do that was invented for LIGO by Ronald Drever, who is one of the three co-founders. Uh, in an era when it was thought that, in principle, you could not make a laser as stable as we needed, he invented a whole new approach to it, uh, building on some prior work by Bob Pound at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, and uh, so th this particular technique, which goes under the phrase locking to an optical cavity, it's a fancy phrase, uh, it grew out of this project. So there are a, a handful of things of this sort but they're not why we do this, and they are not the most important uh, thing. The most important thing is that we are now beginning to see a side of the universe we could never see before. We've never seen a black hole before. Here we saw two black holes collide and create a new black hole. Uh, we are being able to, uh, and, and there's a whole warp side of the universe. I tried to help inspire people about the idea of the warp side of the universe through the movie Interstellar that I worked mm -hmm. on with Christopher Nolan. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, where you see the effects in, on, in human life of the slowing of time near a black hole. Uh, all the uh, science fiction type things that, uh, that are in there, those are real science. 
and they are part of the culture that our children are, are growing up with, and they are going to be part of the culture of the centuries to come. And uh, to tout the book, for those of you who well, saw you, Interstellar, <laughs> this is Kip Thorne's book on the science of Interstellar. And if you don't mind me adding to that, because it's so mm -hmm. important, is yes, there could be some technological advantage that maybe you can stabilize a, with a laser mirror better or whatever. But the most important thing that may come of this is that 15-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 10-year-olds are just going to be totally mesmerized by the beauty and the magic of our cosmos, and maybe they will become great scientists. So I think that is part of discovering that first second of the universe, even if it doesn't uh, have technological payoffs in the near term. Yeah, yes. Yes, uh, uh, on the aisle there, unless somebody else is showing. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question. Uh, lights I'm here. Leroy Harvey. Uh, we live close by the LIGO facility uh, at Livingston, Livingston Parish. But um, I was reading. Did it get hit by the storms? Pardon? Did it get flooded? Uh, well, uh, the area around it got no, flooded. It's bad. right north of Baton Rouge, right? Hey, right, right, right. And a lot east, of Baton Rouge got flooded. But anyway, I was reading an, an article that said that uh, one of the practical applications for the uh, gravitational waves was that we could create a miniature space probe that could use the gravitational waves as a propulsion device in, in, in which this uh, probe could actually approach the speed of light over a period of time and, 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 and send probes to great distances uh, as far as us to, you know, to, uh, to gather information. And this is, seemed to me very fascinating. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, but I wish it was gravitational waves. It's actually, so th this is an idea which I hope happens. It seems to make sense. But it's actually using light power from a laser to drive a solar sail on a miniature spacecraft uh, and uh, drive it up to close to the speed of light in order to reach Alpha Centauri, the nearest uh, other stellar system, uh, solar system to our own, uh, in a matter of about a decade and send back uh, 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 signals uh, wow. to Earth of what's been But seen. you've also written about and, gravitational slingshots. And so, and so, so, but that particular idea is with light uh, from laser beams uh, gravi what, when, we, uh, when we are much more advanced than we are today, or if I think of a very advanced civilization, uh, uh, the, one of the most uh, wonderful ways to get up to high speeds is with the aid of gravity and through what's called a gravitational slingshot, which does appear, uh, at least in the dialogue in the movie Interstellar. Uh, so if you have the ideal thing, you have two black holes going around each other, not yet colliding. And, and uh, if you have a spacecraft and you go in and you go around, get in orbit around one of the black holes, then leave, go toward the other black hole when they're moving toward each other swing around it, go toward this one when they're moving toward each other, you basically can build up to very high speed, close to the speed of light, by bouncing back and forth between these two black holes as they orbit each other, uh, and without you feeling any acceleration. Well, that's uh, definitely a practical so utility. It's a, it's a very, you like that one. Very, very, Last very practical question for, in the way back. For, for one million years from now. All right, well, we can, well. well thank you very time much. Is I'd, like relative. To, I'd like to follow up on this lady's question, yeah. uh, which is if I want to go home and tell my 10 year old grandson that we now have discovered gravitational waves, how do I tell him or her? <clears throat> what that, what the significance is, and secondly, how can you get all this information out of what essentially is an infinitesimally small movement? So, I think you say that uh, there's whole, there's a whole as side of the universe that we've never seen before. It's objects and phenomena that aren't made from matter like you and me. They're made from warp space and warp time, like you see in the movie Interstellar. And uh, we want to learn about that. 
we've been missing it. And it's a fascinating side of the universe. The gravity, and the only way to explore this side of the universe is through waves that are made of the same thing from warp space and time. And so for the first time now in human history, we have the ability to explore the warped side of the universe, explore black holes uh, that are made from warp space and time and other uh, phenomena like this. Your second issue was, uh, was how do you get all this information out from, uh, from such tiny motions? They're tiny motions but they go back and forth a number of times and uh, just as uh, the, in a concert, uh, you can take the, uh, the sound from a concert, you can put it on an oscilloscope screen and see it go up and down, wiggling and wiggling. Those are the sound waves. These are like sound waves in that sense. And uh, the music from an orchestra carries a lot of information, uh, a lot of pleasure as well. Uh, and this is quite similar. The motions are tiny, but uh, they, they are motions that have a lot of information in those time, uh, uh, that are carrying a lot of information. We get the information out by comparing with computer simulations, as I've said. I can think of no better way to end than thinking of the 10-year-old who's going to be told there's new ways and new places to explore that we can never have imagined before. You mentioned the Renaissance. If you go back to the heart of it, in 1492, we were exploring for the sake of exploring. Uh, Leonardo was doing engineering for the and anatomy just for knowledge's sake. Uh, Michelangelo was sculpting just for art's sake. Sometimes we do things because we're human just for the sake of it. Thank you for doing it. Thank you, Walter.